Hey, welcome to another tutorial. Uh, so this will be another one on making cards and this I'm going to go more in depth and we'll really break down the anatomy of a card like all the steps, what happens when you drag a card from your hand, release it, uh, pay the cost, uh, the effects, etc. Uh, so this will be an overview of that. Uh, in further videos I'll go more into specific details of this but this will be a, a fairly detailed but still uh, an overview. Um, so here we are in the arena testing stage. Uh, I have set one starting artifact at the moment. Uh, you don't need to have that. Uh, and I've set up the hand uh, so that we draw cards in uh, order uh, by unchecking random order in the hand pile component. Um, so that's the setup that I'm using. Uh, compared to the previous tutorials on cards, you'll notice I'll have a different, uh, a slightly different uh, folder structure here with many folders put in a demo folder uh, and so give you a peek behind the curtain I'm making these tutorials as I am still in the review process for the assets and therefore uh, I was told by Epic to move some uh, of uh, the assets here into a demo folder so that's why it's different that's also why I uh, couldn't continue on the same branch I was working on so uh, I'm starting from scratch here compared to the other two card tutorials. Um, so therefore we'll just set up stuff uh, briefly um, so that we have our own uh, card data tables. So we're going to data and cards and we will create again a data table based on card that I'm calling DT cards tutorial. So we will be using this for our custom cards. So like before, we'll be creating a card from scratch here, but I'll go more into detail in the, what we are adding. Uh, so we'll create a new one. Uh, so for this card, uh, I don't really have a plan for what we're going to be doing with it yet. So I'll just call it tutorial card. And we'll need to have a name for it. So call it tutorial card and description, we'll figure that out as we go. So the visual stuff we can set up briefly, I've covered how to do that before. Uh, so uh, again, I had to add some new stuff here. So if you go to demo and textures, yeah, or there you have you know all the portraits. I've added this extra portrait to uh, tutorials, uh, to this tutorial folder, uh, which you can also download. So this is just a super weird part of uh, Hieronymus Bosch painting uh, that we can use for this card because like I said I, I don't know how this card is going to end up yet so I just took this completely weird picture so who knows what that can inspire us to make uh, but I've called it armor so it seems like something that maybe should give us armor at least so we have a portrait uh, we'll get to the other stuff later this is really enough uh, so that we can get this card in our hand and that it looks appropriate uh, so then we can uh, we can go to our decks. Let's see, yeah, not demo, but data and decks, and we can add a tutorial deck. Actually, I'll duplicate the uh, cards in the starter deck for this, so we don't have to make a ton of new ones there. And for this first card. I will uh, choose our tutorial cards and our tutorial card there. Now if we hit play, uh, yeah let's see if we still haven't selected that deck so we'll have to go to blueprints, core and our game instance and we can set our starting deck to tutorial and I'll turn off this starting artifact I had activated so we don't mess up anything with any starting artifacts. Uh, current encounter is fine. We can fight against a troll. So if you've seen my node map tutorials, you've seen how you can uh, create encounter data tables um, to load encounters. But if you don't want to load stuff from the node map and you just want to test stuff inside the arena map, then you can go into the game instance and you can set up stuff directly here. Um, so then you can just test that out and in the arena. So now that we have selected our tutorial deck, we should get our new card. And here it is, the tutorial card, which costs nothing and does nothing, but looks neat. 
Okay, so let's make this card do something. But instead of just creating a card, going through the data table um, and adding things like I've done in previous tutorials, we'll do this in the order in which it happens in the blueprint so that we can show the structure of when uh, how cards are activated and how they are used. Uh, so I'm going to go into that. For that purpose, I have created this flowchart, which you can also find linked in the description, which shows um, the order in which things are activated within a card. And you'll see here that a lot happens within two different blueprints. You have this widget blueprint, which is the uh, card widget, uh, and you have the card itself, BP card. Um, so uh, here we have the starting points. So when a card is uh, is dropped and when a card is dragged. Uh, so we can start at this part here. So when we drag a card, that is when we pick up a card from the hand and drag it onto the screen, and then nothing really happens uh, until it hits the active zone. And I'll show, I'll demonstrate that here. Oh, there's some lag there. Uh, it's because I'm downloading stuff on the side here. Um, Okay, so um, for the block, you see that when we get up to this active zone area, uh, then it lights up in green. And you can also see that the targets that it will affect, in this case our warrior hero here, uh, gets this white outline. And this indicates to the player that if we release the card here, the card will be used. While if we release it here, it will be returned to the hand. When we release it here, you will see that I will be paying the mana cost and we will get armor. So mana cost and armor. Uh, and now let's look at that in the flowchart. So you can see when we drag the card and if we get to the active zone, uh, at this point, uh, this card wants to check, can we play this card? Because if we are not able to play it, uh, perhaps we don't have the mana, uh, then uh, we don't want to have it light up green or show any targets or anything like that and give players the wrong idea that they could use the card. Uh, so to do that, we don't want to uh, have the widget be responsible for any actual card logic. This is more for player input. Uh, so the widget asks BP card um, if uh, this card is playable. Um, and uh, we will get into how it does this. It loops through use rules. We're going to look at this very shortly uh, and then decides, are we allowed to use this card? And if we are, then we display the activation. We get the green outline, etc. If not, then we return the card to hand. We can test this uh, quickly. Uh, a card that is not allowed. If we go to our, uh, our tutorial card here and we can increase the, uh, the use cost, the mana cost beyond uh, the starting mana that we have. So if I set this to 5, for instance, and we hit play, and if I try to drag this card up, you'll see that it gets returned to the hand automatically, and we get this uh, message that we don't have enough mana. Um, so that is what we are looking at here, uh, that it is not allowed, and we return the card uh, to the hand. So how does this part work, the checking through the use rules? Uh, so we'll go to that now. Uh, and this happens like you saw on the flowchart in uh, BP card, which we can find here. Uh, but let's also open the card widgets, which you can find in widgets, and WP, uh, WBP card. So we can see how it calls this. So there are there's a lot of stuff that happens in the event graph of the card widget here. So the card widget is really, you know, for visualization of the card. Um, the, all the logic happens within the card, BP card, so this is done so that it should be relatively easy, easy to swap out with some other kind of visual, because the actual important game logic is within this invisible blueprint. So keeping visual separate uh, from game logic has been a goal uh, of how I've structured um, this uh, toolkit, as it has all kinds of benefits. Uh, so this is the relevant part here, uh, looking at determining the result of card release. So when we release the card somewhere on our screen, uh, we will check uh, first, is the card active? This is uh, checking if we have the green glowy border, we are in the active region, etc. Uh, so if not, then we return the card to the hand, as we saw. Um, and uh, But if it is active, so we should be able to use the card. Uh, because uh, if we were not able to, it shouldn't have been lighting up green. 
then we will attempt to use the card. Um, so we have already checked the uh, whether we are allowed to use the card when the card was dragged into the active zone. But we, when we attempt to do so, we actually do the same thing again. So we check again if we can uh, use the card. Uh, just so we can't you know, trust the widget um, to be responsible for knowing if we can activate a card or not, or not. So we will attempt and we will again ask the card. At this point, can we still use the card? Um, so this is you know, generally a good design to keep this uh, game logic out of widgets, mostly if you're making really a network game, which of course this toolkit is not made for, uh, but it is uh, the way I design it. Uh, it's good to keep uh, it clean and separate that way. Um, so um, to look at the flowchart, you can see that the same thing happens here as happens here. So when the card is dragged and all this, we check the loop, uh, the use rules, if it is playable, we do the exact same thing when we drop the card if it is in the active zone. So we do the same thing, but at the point if we drop it and it's playable, that's when we continue to actually using the card. So the same thing happens here and here. And um, yeah, and having gone through that, I'll finally go through what we're actually doing here. So when we go to attempt to use card in BP card, what do we do? Well, we check, first we check, should we skip if we want to know if this is playable or not? If you want to, for some reason, tell the card to play it itself, even though um, it might not be allowed to. Uh, there can be in-game reasons you want to just force playing a card. Uh, but generally, we want to not skip this. And then we want to check if the card is playable. And within this function, you can see that we loop through all of what are called the use rules in the card. And if any of these use rules say that they are not allowed, uh, then we fail out. We say that it's not playable. Um, and we play, uh, we display this uh, log message uh, to the screen, a fail message, which uh, can be uniquely set up within each use rule. Uh, though if it is playable, of course, then uh, if we loop through all of them and none of them say that they're not allowed, then the card uh, is considered to be playable. And then we actually call the used card event. But uh, we will look more into these use rules uh, here before going any further. So use rules, where are they set up? Well, we can check that in the event graph of BP card. Uh, we're at, um, or is it the, no, yeah, it is the event graph. Yeah, here, in the initialize from data. Uh, that's what happens at begin play for the card, uh, where it goes through all of the card data and it sets up any references that it's going to need and spawns any, uh, any components that it's going to need access to. Uh, and you will see, um, yeah, besides all of this, uh, setting up the various kinds of data. Um, at this point, we add the use rule. Uh, rule. So uh, what it does now, this card, is to look at uh, basically the uh, card data here and look for the use rules, which are in the card data. Uh, in this case, we have one use rule, the stat cost use rule, uh, and then it will add a use rule component of that class uh, to this card and then call to initialize it and add it to this array. So that from then on, we have access, easy access to all of the use rule uh, components on this card uh, that we can access when, uh, when needed. So there aren't really that many use rules included by default, at least not in this initial launch. Um, so you can see here uh, in the use rules, if we look for them, we have use rule, we have stat cost, and we have unplayable. So use rule is just the parent blueprint, which is really designed to be overridden by other, by child blueprints. And stat cost, which is that we have a cost that we need to pay to use it, which is really just mana that is used um, in the demo project. Um, and then unplayable, which you can just add to a card that you want to not be playable. Because if we remove all the use rules, we can do that. Let's delete all of them from this card. Um, and if we don't have any use rules, it will never reference the use costs. So uh, keeping this here or not doesn't really matter. Uh, I can just keep it if we want to reactivate uh, the mana cost later. So now I've disabled this use rule, and you will see that it still has this use cost. So it displays as five. Uh, but we can still use it. It does nothing when used. Uh, so yeah. 
So it was a bit wrong to see that this does nothing because it's referenced by the card visual. So if we re uh, remove this and get this card, then you see that we have no uh, mana crystal on the top of this card and we can use it because no rules um, that it loops through uh, returns that it cannot be used, therefore it can be used because there are no, uh, it has no use rules at all. Um, we could uh, change this to a different use rule. Um, so let's see, use rules are here and if we take the unplayable use rule you can see now card is unplayable. And we can start by looking at the unplayable use rule because it is fairly simple. Uh, so if we go here back to this card and we can browse to the, this use rule, you can see that all the use rules are within blueprints and the, this card use rules folder. And you can see that it has this one overridden function, which is check if use is allowed. And all it does is say no, it's not allowed. And it also has this displayed fail, fail message, which you can customize um, based on the use rule that you are uh, that you have here. Um, and the parent use rule itself, we can look at here. Uh, it has a few different functions, which are over. It can be overridden by uh, child actors. Um, so or child blueprints and uh, check if use is allowed so by default the use rule just says that it's allowed uh, you don't really have an, a reason to add this particular use rule uh, just the use rule parent to a card because uh, it will do essentially the same thing as having no use rule um, so resolve use consequence uh, so this i'll get to next uh, so this is uh, after you are allowed to use a card, should there be any consequences to using this? And all that is used for in the current um, toolkit is to uh, uh, subtract the mana cost. Initialize use rule is if you need something to trigger or be set up in this use rule when it is generated. Uh, so what is done by default uh, here is to just create a reference to the card that holds this use rule, which might uh, be referenced within any of these other functions here. Um, so we will look at the third use rule, which is the stat cost one. Um, so here is check if use is allowed. Uh, and how does this work? Well, we go to the card player, uh, if you recall from previous tutorials so this is the um, the actor that represents the uh, the player which holds the card hand and which has mana um, and all this so the the player the representation of the player is kept separate from the minions that they control like in many games in this genre you have a single hero so you could maybe have tied two of those together uh, but in others you have may have many different minions you might have no minions and still be able to use cards such as in monster trainer games like this so i kept those separate but we find this card player uh, in this stat cost use rule and we check uh, the uh, the parent card uh, the stats in um, that it has currently when held in the hand and it then loops through all of these use costs uh, which are the same ones uh, that you can find here, the use costs. So we can create one of those so it's clear what we're looking at here. So we have a mana cost. Uh, you might add other kinds of stats. Uh, you could create, you know, a Magic the Gathering style system where you have different kinds of mana, etc. But we're uh, for this uh, demo game, we just have a single one and then we add a cost. So this is what we're looking at in this use rule. We're checking through all of the use rules, uh, and I'll switch this back to the stat cost. We check, uh huh, we have the stat cost use rule. Uh, we want to check if we're allowed to play it. So then, in this stat cost use rule, it checks, uh, it loops through all of the use costs, which are these ones here. So the mana one, it says, okay, I have a use cost. I need to have the mana component, and it needs to have a value of at least two. Um, that's what the stat cost is going to check here because it goes to it looks at the card player first and checks okay um, does the card player have this component in other words does the card player have a mana component 
Uh, we can check the card player, by the way, in Blueprints Core and BP Card Player. And you can see that we have loads of components here, and one of them is mana. And it has a default value of zero, but we also have a different status, which is actually mana gain, which is a status which gives the card player three mana at the start of each turn by default. Um, so then, so it checks, okay, does the card player have the mana component? If you haven't changed the card player in some way, then it should. Uh, so this, uh, so this should return as valid. Um, and if so, it checks, okay, so the status value of this, uh, this mana component, is it greater or equal to the, uh, the mana costs, uh, since we're looking at the same component here, of the parent card, which would be two in this case. And if so, uh, then we, uh, we actually do nothing. Uh, if, not, if, it's not, if it's not enough, then we say we're not allowed to use this card. And we're printing that there's not enough and we get the friendly name of the component, which in this case is set to mana within the uh, the uh, mana status component. So we will print then not enough mana. Uh, so we loop through all of the um, uh, the various um, stat costs we might have. Uh, by default, like I said, we are only checking mana. Uh, but if we had many, then we will check through all of them. And then if none of them, we have uh, we have enough of all of them, we should go to completed without uh, returning out here, and we will say that we are allowed to use this card. Uh, so that's what happens here. Right, so at this point, I think we can go back to BP card and understand what happens here. So, uh, or not here, but in attempt use card and check if playable. That is, we're looping through all of the use rules, we're checking if use is allowed in all of them, uh, and then we are returning playable if, uh, if none of them say that they're not usable, uh, which will be the case if we have enough mana. Uh, so that's this part. Uh, so after that, we go on to the use card part, which is the uh, which is quite a bit uh, to cover, really. Um, but we can go back to the flowchart and see the next step in the process here. Um, so we have checked if it's playable. We loop through all of the use rules. We figure out, is it allowed? Yes, it is allowed. Um, and then uh, we resolve the use rule consequences. Um, so that is something you might have specified in the use rule. So we'll look at this next. Uh, so first we call a couple of events here. We, uh, we call out to the global dispatcher hub uh, that, we are, um, uh, that we are using a card uh, as an action. Uh, and also that we have an event we're calling that this is just before we are just about to uh, to play a card. So look at my tutorial on the uh, event system to understand how these work. Uh, so we can uh, we could input here that we want to skip the consequences, um, but generally this will be set to false, and then we will resolve the usual con consequences just like we saw in the flowchart. Um, and here again we loop through all of the use rules, but this time instead of checking if they can be played, we call this resolve use consequence function for all of them. And by default this does nothing, uh, it just says that it's a success, so you want to override this in the child, uh, the child blueprint components of the use rule. So if we go to the stat costs and resolve use consequences, you can see here that what we want to do, the consequence in this case, is that we want to uh, pay the mana cost. Um, so we again we go to the card player um, and we get all of the costs in the hand. So this is very similar to checking if use is allowed, only that this time instead of checking if we have this stat, because we have already checked this when we checked if use uh, was allowed, so we don't need to do validity checks here. We know that we have the appropriate uh, component, uh, the appropriate stats or status. Um, so therefore we can just loop through all of these costs and we can sub subtract this value from the status of the card player for each of this, these costs. So which in this case will be just the mana cost itself. Uh, and then also we call this event uh, as an action that there is a resource change. Uh, so this is what is used for uh, the mana crystal display down here to change uh, its mana value. Uh, as part of the action queue. Uh, so that is that part. 
And so after resolving the use consequences um, in use card, uh, then we are ready to begin uh, using the card in earnest. Uh, and if we go back to the uh, flowchart here, we can see, okay, we resolved all of the use rule consequences within the use rule blueprint. Uh, and now we want to loop through any repetitions. So repetitions, what is this? So this is the part of the loop that probably you won't be using that much, uh, but in some cases you will. Uh, so this is that we can uh, set up in the card data. We can check that here um, in these cards. In the bottom here, you can see repetitions. So you can add a value here uh, that you want to repeat the effect of this card several times. Uh, at the moment, of course, we have no card effects, uh, so it will do nothing to repeat the card effect multiple times. So we'll get back to this one later. So for now, we'll skip to the next step, uh, which is... Uh, so we're checking if we're done with all repetitions, but we'll get back to this. Um, and now we will loop through all of the card effects. Uh, so the card effects are the ones you'll find um, here in card effects. We've covered this before in earlier tutorials, so you know some of it, but now we'll go more into the card effects themselves and see what they're actually doing. Um, so for this card, uh, what do we want it to do? So this is an armor card, it seems. <laughs> so we probably want to add some armor. Uh, so for this, uh, so I described what these do, and I'll, I'll do so again, but we'll look closer at it this time. So for the effect class, I want to add a status. I want to add the um, armor status. And I'll say, let's say we add yeah, eight armor for this. Um, actually, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we can, uh, so what makes sense to do is to look at the status we want to add itself, and then we'll figure out which of these various properties here are actually made use of within this card effect. Uh, because uh, rarely will an effect use all of these different values. So these are set up that so that the card effect might make use of them. Uh, so we can look at this card effect and open it up. Um, and we can check then the resolve card effect uh, function, which is the one that actually is responsible for doing whatever the effect uh, is supposed to do. Uh, and for this, what we do is that we have a target actor, um, and for this target actor, which will be our target, uh, which will be our warrior in this case, uh, we will be adding uh, a status. So we're gonna need a target component, uh, which should be a status, as we can see from the cast here. If it's not a status, we're gonna we're gonna fail. We're gonna have no success, as you see. So okay. So first, we're gonna need a target component for this and it should be a status. Uh, so if we go to the card, uh, then we're going to need a target component, so this should be the armor. Um, I think I'm repeating some of the stuff from the earlier tutorials here, but yeah, uh, we're going through all of this, so um, some repeats will be, but I'm going more in detail this time. Um, okay, so we're going to need that. Uh, and next, uh, we see that we're adding the status, and to add the status, we're going to need an effect value. Uh, so at this point, it makes sense you know, to set this to something. I already set this to 8, and that is fine. And then also, we have gameplay tags, which are passed on to the status. So we only really need gameplay tags if these are somehow used by the status. And, and so far, um, uh, we don't seem any reason that we should do so. We could look at the armor status to see if it makes use of gameplay tags. Actually, I mean, uh, just let's do that. Uh, just to do a thorough way, uh, way in which you can, uh, you know, structure creating a new effect for yourself. So we go to statuses. We'll find the armor status, uh, and we'll figure out if it uses, if it ever uses the gameplay tag. So we can just, you know, find references for this, and we see that none are found. So it seems that within the armor status, uh, we are never utilizing the gameplay tags. Uh, so for that, we don't uh, need any particular tags. There might be other reasons, you know, it, it, there could be a different card effect or something, which only affects the effects of cards which have a specific card or something like that. So you might have a reason to do so anyway. 
Um, for instance, there are cards that increase the damage of attack cards. And the way they will do that is that they will look first at the card tags of uh, this card and see if they are marked as an attack um, effect attack. And if they are, it will look through all of their card effects and try to find a card effect which is, has the attack card. And for that card effect, it will increase the uh, effect value. Uh, this is how, how the blacker and blackest berry uh, cards, which incre increase the damage of uh, cards, work, for instance. You can look at those cards if you wanna, uh, want to look at that in more detail. Uh, but since we don't need gameplay tags for this particular effect that we're interested in now, at least, uh, so let's see for this card effect for adding a status. Do we need anything else? It doesn't seem like it currently. So let's see if this is sufficient. So if we hit play and test out our card now, and still it does nothing. <laughs> so not really surprising because what's missing here that the card doesn't know what its target is supposed to be. Uh, so it has nothing to look for. Um, and here we get an error <laughs> exactly for this, yeah. Trying to access, you know, the targeting class uh, of this effect and it can't find any um, any targeting class. So that's what we will have to add next. But I think that we're up on half an hour already. Uh, so I'll say that that is this, that for this part of the tutorial and we'll continue uh, the next one by looking at uh, targeting. Uh, so see you in the next one.